Obophiles. Today we are talking about Furling Etude number 12, which is the fast etude in D minor. So I'm going to talk about the general tips that you can use to practice and learn this etude. I'm going to go over some specific trouble spots, some harder measures and how to work on them. And then I'm going to talk about just auditioning on this etude in general and how to make sure you have the best audition with such a challenging etude. Now this etude is head and shoulders above the other etudes up to this point in the Furling book. And I don't know why it's so much more technically difficult and fast than the other etudes, but it is. And we want to be able to play it well, so let's get into it. But first, a cautionary tale. So this etude is actually really special to me because I remember learning it for the first time when I was in high school auditioning for Allstate Band. And it was really great to learn how to practice with this etude and get some fast technique, but I worked with this etude day and night for like hours every day. And I really drilled in some bad habits in my technique. And so every time this etude has come up since then, I've had to consciously and aggressively unlearn these habits and put in new, more efficient ways of playing. And every time I work on it, whether I'm teaching it or playing it for an audition, it has been especially difficult to get over that hump of past uh, sins and technical, you know, just habits I've worked in. So, in order to avoid that same devastating fate of wasting a lot of time on something that isn't really that challenging, you want to make sure that you're practicing slowly when you're learning this etude. And number two, you want to make sure that you're practicing intentionally and all of your executions are correct versus incorrect executions, which just groove in bad ways of playing. And lastly, you want to make sure that you click that thumbs up button below to like the video so that other people can also learn how to play the oboe in a nice, relaxed, and efficient way. Now, the video is going to get into the weeds a little bit with how to get this etude up to snuff because I know it is a really common audition etude for all state across the country and even other auditions like maybe for band camps or high school band auditions, this etude comes up a lot. If you need more specialized help, or you want to make a custom plan on how to achieve your goals, I offer video lessons as well. And you can find that information in the description below if you would like some help. Or if you just need reads, I also sell reads and I've been getting some really cool reviews lately of people enjoying the reads. So I'm so happy about that. And you know, if you need to read, I'm happy to make one for you. I think the most overlooked thing that can help you with these super technical etudes is just having really good fundamentals in the key that you're working in. Obviously, you should practice your scales in all keys, major and minor, as well as your scales in thirds and arpeggios. But if you're working on a fast stage like this and you might not be comfortable with all of your scales, you at least want to be comfortable in the key that you're playing in. So in this case, we're going to be working in D minor. So you want to be able to play your D minor scale. <laughs> scale in thirds, some arpeggiated sequences that you just have memorized, and maybe even like some other technical passages in that key that will allow you to cut, copy, and paste into the etude number 12 that you're working on. Now, it can be really tempting to limit yourself to only the scale studies that are given to you in band class or even that are in a particular method book, but you want to be creative. You can either go out and find online other scale studies, and I have one myself that I've written and it's in the description below, or you can go buy some books and find some scale studies, or even better, you can make them up by yourself. You know what's hard about D minor, by now, there's some left hand F situations that you want to be aware of. You want to know if you're going to use B flat or B natural or C sharp or C natural. So challenge yourself. Try different rhythm patterns, try different articulations, try different interval sequences. Maybe that's all easy to you. And in that case, that's awesome. I'm super glad about that. But you always want to be challenging yourself with slow scales, fast scales, and different scale patterns every day, especially in the key that you're working on, to really always be improving your technique. 
if you're not actively improving your technique, your technique doesn't stay still. It will gradually become sloppier. So make sure you're being proactive about the technique in D minor. The other thing that I think people neglect when they're working on scales is they limit their range from D to D. But if you look at the etude, you go past this. So make sure you're playing your scales from the lowest point up to the highest point so that you are fully comfortable with those fingerings and getting to those high notes from lower notes is a great idea. So you might do a long tone exercise that looks like this. I'm just gonna go D to F to practice going from D to F in the high register, but I want it to be as easy as if it were in the low register. Okay, that's good for getting their fundamentals under control. Now let's talk about the difficulties of particular measures in this etude, because unlike the other fast etudes where there might be one or two really hard measures, this etude has a lot of really technical measures that you do have to know a little bit more about how the instrument works than just aggressively playing through the hard spots, which is what I did in high school and got some really uh, tense finger habits going on. So let's avoid that at all costs, at all costs, at all costs. The first one is in the first line. It's really hard to keep yourself relaxed when you're going for that high F and then down the D minor arpeggio. So practice that section slowly and you want to be using the left hand side because the right hand side is being used by the C. Now the trick to this is to not squeeze the life out of the right hand as you go for that high section. Otherwise, you'll get stuck. The other thing to look out for as you go through the very next measure, which is measure four, is that when you're coming down, if you're too tense, you might slip off the hole on the E key. So be careful not to be squeezing too hard with your right hand. Stay relaxed so that you don't accidentally push the key down without getting that hole covered. And I'm playing slowly so that I can be really sure of what I'm feeling with my hands and my breath. The very next measure, measure five, has a interesting C sharp to B sharp situation. Now a lot of people, and I see this a lot, will try to rock their pinky back and forth. And that puts a lot of strain on your wrist and on your, uh, what would that be, like your carpals. Now, I did that when I was in high school and it took me a long time to unlearn it. But now that I have, I wanna share it with you. You should play C to C sharp, or rather B sharp to C sharp in this case, by pressing the C sharp key and then getting onto the skinny part of the C key so that you can get back and forth between the two with as little motion as possible. The other thing throughout this whole section is to make sure that you're emphasizing the accents. It can be really easy just to focus on getting the notes and not showing where the drama is in the music. So if it has an accent written, make sure that you're giving that a little bit more love, either in time or airspeed or vibrato or some way to really bring it out of the texture. Starting in measure nine, there are a series of cascading arpeggios. It's important to identify what is the flavor of these arpeggios to begin with, and then practicing it slowly and efficiently so that you're not grabbing at each of the keys or each of the notes, especially if they're a little bit new uh, colors for So we'll do the first one together. The first one, I see the notes F sharp, A, C, and E flat, and then they're just repeated after that. Now I stack them, and luckily in this case they're just stacked upside down. In this particular case it doesn't matter what you pick as the bottom note because they're all minor thirds apart, which would make it a diminished chord. Diminished seventh, in fact. Or fully diminished, depending on who you're talking to. So just be familiar with the vocabulary of these chords as you go through them. And if you need help with this, uh, I'd love to talk about it further. Let me know in the comments below if you guys would appreciate a uh, theory lesson as it pertains to oboe music, because that can be really useful to know. So I would practice it a bunch of different ways, which you might already know. 
The first ways are just going to be varying the rhythms and varying the articulations, which I think most people are comfortable with at this stage. And I have a whole video on how to get to that point if you aren't comfortable with it, and that's in the description as well. If you feel in control of all the different patterns, you can play it backwards. And if that's easy for you as well, you can try playing it down a half step and see how that goes for you. If that is easy and under control, go on to the next one. Remember to practice slowly and always intentionally. I think the next difficult spot that almost everyone has trouble with at first is measure 26. This one is a little bit of a doozy, uh, and the reason is because you're going up to that high F from the D and it's all slurred. So just go slowly again. I think the key for this one is to use the full fingering for F if you're using a Royale. If you're using an AK, there's a different fingering that I think might work better, and that is using the third octave key, half full, two, A flat key, and that's it. It's a short fingering, uh, but I think it works better for the AK intonation-wise. For the Royale, I think the intonation is actually better just using the full fingering. So that would be half full, two, first octave key, a flat and E flat key on the left side, and then two, three on the bottom. If you need help learning the fingerings for these high register notes, I have a full video dedicated to it covering fingerings, air speeds, and exercises in the description below. Make sure when you're going slow to find the taffy and thread that through all of the notes. And that way, your hands will just automatically know where to go when you get to it at a fast tempo. Lastly, it's really important that you're not intimidated by the final tempo goal. I know it says to go quarter note equals 132, but that's super fast. If you find that you're eventually able to go that tempo, that's fantastic. But there is no shame in going quarter note equals 100 if it is clean and even, which is a way more admirable goal to have. If you're auditioning for Allstate with this etude and a judge hears you play it at 100, that's perfectly clean, versus an auditioner who plays it very sloppy at 130, you're going to win. And that's awesome. If you play it at 80 and it's very clean, you'll still win over the guy who plays it too fast and very sloppy. So. Always prioritize cleanliness, ease of playing, intonation, and expression of your air over final velocities. They're not as important as people make them out to be. In the audition, you may be asked to play a cut of the etude. So when you're practicing, make sure that you come up with your own cuts. Or you can roll a die and see what number comes up, and that's where you're going to start. Or maybe you do that number plus 11. Or come up with your own algorithm to give yourself a random cut of the music. Or you can even ask a friend or even your teacher to pick a random cut so that you can practice auditioning on different segments and not always starting at the beginning and going all the way to the end. Some of the parts of the etude, especially as I was trying to record it, do not happen with 1000% reliability unless you put in the time so that it can become automatic. And that's all just like neural training. It has nothing to do with the strength of your hands, or of your breath, uh, but it does have to do with getting your mind to tell your muscles what to do at the exact moment without you using so much thought power. But on that note, this etude is very athletic and you will not be able to play it back to back to back to back just because it requires so much precision in both the air, the tongue, and the fingers. So, after I play this etude a few times in a row, my fingers actually become really hard to control. So keep that in mind as you practice, and keep your practice sessions very focused on a particular skill, measure, or task. Playing it straight through a bunch of times in a row is not going to be very productive, just because you won't have the strength to further work and refine other details. I hope that you guys learn a lot from working on this etude. It's one of my favorites, and when in doubt, play beautifully.